Steve Paul, I'm the President of the American Foundation. We're pleased to be the host of today's uh, seminar and, and presentations. Just a couple of uh, programming notes, and I'll turn the floor over to my friend Len Downey, who's going to run the interviews and discussion today. Um, today's event is a product of a partnership between New America and Arizona State University, which has been um, a real privilege for us to be involved with over the last year or so. Um, it began with the sense that there was a lot of uh, material, ideas, research, information, insight from the West that was not reaching Washington in important ways. And since we live as a public policy institute, we try to connect uh, media and policy makers and, and other um, influential constituents of DC with new ideas and new research. This proposition of bringing technological change and demographic change and the political changes both produced from the West to Washington seems like an appealing idea. It's worked out very well over the last 12 months. We've run a number of conferences around that framework and most of them have involved the influence of technology on the assumptions of Washington policymakers. So we have one coming up in a couple of weeks about radical life extension and its implications for environmental policy. So we've got all these uh, projections on the fiscal side at a moment of intense debate about fiscal options in the United States that basically flatline life expectancy when there's a lot of work going on in biology that suggests those assumptions are going to be overtaken. And that's an example of the sort of discourse between West and East that we were hoping to oppose. And as it's gone along, we realize there's a lot more to this possibility than just technology. And that's where kind of today starts. We were thinking a little bit about the um, election cycle, but even more broadly about the immigration debate and the way that Arizona has become a kind of witness test for the country's uh, engagement with its own anxieties, its own um, anger and its own debates about change. And we thought we have uh, a relationship with Arizona State allows us to think maybe a little more deeply than is normally possible when you're so far away from the setting of such discourse. And that's the purpose of today's event. So I'm really pleased to be able to turn this over to my friend Len Downey, longtime executive editor of the Washington Post, a great friend and partner of mine when I worked there in the newsroom over 20 years. Uh, now a professor at, uh, what's the proper name, the Walter Cronkite School of uh, Journalism at Arizona State University, and uh, someone who's been very active in the, in the new um, formations of journalism in this curious digital transition, especially on the nonprofit side, on the boards of most of the important uh, organizations that are lighting a new way. So uh, with that, I turn it over to Len. Welcome. And in turn, to start things off, um, I want to introduce uh, Lottie Kaur, uh, who was a former president of Arizona State University uh, and uh, responsible, along with his successor, President Crow, in making remarkable strides uh, in the growth of that university and its, uh, uh, and its uh, place in American universities on many, many fronts. Uh, Dr. Kaur was before that the president of the University of Vermont. Uh, he's a lifelong political scientist, but he is really, really cares about Arizona. And so when he left the presidency of uh, Arizona State University he, in, 19, in 2002, after 12 years as president, during which time the endowment grew there tenfold, the capital campaign raised half a billion dollars, and the enrollment and honors quadrupled, and student diversity increased significantly in addition to the reputation of the university, he turned his uh, sights to the entire state of Arizona, uh, not just its leading university, uh, with apologies, University of Arizona, as usual, um, and established the Center for uh, the Future of Arizona uh, in downtown Phoenix uh, and, and near uh, the downtown campus of ASU uh, to uh, focus on the critical issues facing the state of Arizona and particularly to point the way towards solutions and citizen involvement in those solutions, what he calls a do-tank 
rather than a think tank, with apologies to think tanks. And he'll explain that concept now uh, and give us an introduction to the really critical issues facing Arizona today that will be the backdrop for the rest of this program. Dr. Korth. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Steve. Thank you, New America Foundation. We love this relationship. It gives us a window into activities that from the distance of Phoenix and of Arizona are not as readily available to us, so we greatly treasure it. Uh, I am also pleased that you have called this session a case study in polarized midterm politics of recession rather than report from a rogue state which keeps <laughs> catching attention in ways that we have myriads of committees saying, how do we burnish the image of Arizona after what's happened to us? Uh, 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 let me try to make some sense out of it, largely by way of setting the stage for the two panels that will be part of this, central part of this program today. First, for those of you who don't know Arizona well, and a reminder of those who do, let's get a few facts about who we are on the table. Physically, we're very large, fifth largest in the nation, and yet only 17% of our land is privately owned. Interestingly, in a libertarian, capitalist-based setting, so much of it is publicly owned. We are 6.6 .6 million people. That has moved us since 2000 from the 20th largest state in the nation to the 14th. And if you look at the progression of that growth, we were 2.7 million in 1980. And when I went to ASU in 1990, 3.6 million. So we virtually doubled just in that 20 year period. We are the second most urban state in the nation, curiously. Uh, Nevada is the most urban because of Reno and Las Vegas, not dissimilar to us, although ours is in the Phoenix-Tucson corridor. And our urban areas now have four million in Phoenix, twice the size of 1990 when it was two. So Phoenix is now larger than Arizona as a whole was 30 years ago. And Tucson now has moved from roughly three quarters of a million, uh, two thirds of a million actually, to a million. Um, we are today uh, about 40 percent, approaching 40 percent minority, and probably the most, and a significant part of that, by the way, is our Native American population, the largest reservation based Native American population in America. It's about 4.6 percent of our population. But the most significant measure not including undocumented, is that our Latino population has grown from 16% of the whole in, in 1980 to 30% of the whole today. Do the math. The state has doubled in size, and the percentage of our population that's Latino has doubled in size. A significant effect, I think, on the issues that have uh, some of the turmoil going on. Probably the greatest surprise is that we're the 10th youngest state in terms of the age of our population. Uh, we rank of 27th in over 65 population, but 10th in population under 18. The over 65 population, for example, Florida is first, Arizona's 27th. So there is a greater range of population than I think popular opinion has had as uh, us as a retirement state. And finally, our politics. Um, interesting progression. Statehood in 1912, the last of the contiguous 48 to gain statehood. From 1912 to 1930, there were three Democratic governors, three Republican governors. With the New Deal, from 31 to 1950, six Democrats, no Republicans. Since 1952, the Eisenhower election, six Republicans, seven Democrats, up to the last elected governor when Janet Napolitano uh, was, was elected in 2006, or 2008 rather, the last time around. Registration, party registration, is Democratic 32%, Republican 36%, <coughs> Independent 31 percent. 
So it is a rather interesting balance, and predictions are that independents will outpace either party uh, by 2014. In the presidential elections, every election since 1952, save one, has gone Republican, and that one that went Democratic was for Bill Clinton in 1996. And interestingly as well, of our eight congressional districts, five are currently held by Democrats. What does a center called the Center for the Future of Arizona and a do tank do to try to create an environment in which the major issues facing our state uh, have been developed? Well, we, we decided the best way to proceed since the conventional ways of setting agendas, parties, do not much in our state, even lamentably nationally. Candidates who have only one or two issues, not the breadth of the issues for the, for the future. We decided to take a rather audacious step of creating a citizen's agenda called the Arizona We Want. We engaged the Gallup organization, and they, with us, produced the most comprehensive uh, statement of Arizonans' views about what they want for the future. From it came uh, 13 goals and issues, ranging all the way from not only job creation, but what they wanted specifically within job creation, education, management of the natural environment and growth, water management, through immigration and state finances, structure of state government. What we found most surprising of the eight goals that we had asked specific questions about is that one quarter of the responses, two of the eight goals, spoke to the importance of citizen engagement, citizen connectedness to one another. So the highlights I want to put on the table today to help stimulate our conversation are drawn from the Arizona We Want report itself. It's on our web at the Arizona We Want, all one word, dot org. Looks like this. You can download it all. You can actually even take the poll. And a report we just released two weeks ago called the Arizona Civic Health Index, triggered by this question of citizen engagement, citizen connectedness to one another. So what did we find? First, using the Gallup definition of engagement, which we and, and Knight Foundation persuaded them to call attachment, Arizona residents, Arizona citizens, are more highly attached to where they live than any of the other locations, the 26 Knight Ritter communities that have ever taken the report. They are more passionate about and loyal to where they live across the board, by ethnicity, by age, by geography within the state. And yet we found very low engagement. I submit that's one of the important issues for us as a state and hopefully for this conversation. How is it that you can have such high attachment and such low engagement? Our voter registration is 40th in the nation. Our voter turnout is 43rd. Young people actually voted in a lesser percentage in 08 presidential election than in the 04 presidential election, whereas the, same, the, the reverse was true nationally. Urban population in Arizona registers more and votes more than rural, also contrary to the trend nationally. So the issue of high attachment, low engagement, we think is very well, is very important. We found as part of our exploration in the Civic Health Index also that Arizonans are less well informed than other citizens across all forms of media. Roughly 15% below the national average in terms of magazine readership, newspaper readership, television viewership, radio listenership, and social media. 13 states this year did their own state index in conjunction with the National Conference on Citizenship, which with the U.S. Census Bureau is the engine that drives this data. Arizona ranks at the bottom of that in being informed. So low engagement and low information. Secondly, Arizona is a state of high diversity. 
approaching 40%, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and yet historically low levels of friction. One of the things that struck me most when I moved to Arizona from the Northeast was the degree to which the collisions of black and brown and of the tensions that I had seen carried out very actively in communities with which I had been involved simply have not historically been the case. Uh, in my view, that suggests a foundation, even as the larger issues swirl about us, for finding a foundation and a base for resolving some of the issues that have now been exacerbated by the recent legislation in Arizona Senate Bill 1070, a foundation of some importance. And we found throughout the report, no distinct, both reports, no significant differences in, uh, significant differences in ethnicity in terms of people's attitudes about issues and about the institutions that serve us. Third, there is a surprisingly high congruence of viewpoints in Arizona across the state. In Arizona, that's not believed. People in Tucson think people in Phoenix are a different creature. They call it the state of Maricopa, the county in which Phoenix is located. And yet we find that there is, uh, on the major issues, the Gallup Arizona poll found substantial, congru uh, substantial congruence of view, but very low regard for elected officials. Only 10% of the Arizonans in the Gallup poll felt elected, their elected officials represented their interests, uh, in our view, extraordinarily Im important. Uh, we also find, however, substantial disconnect between citizens and their elected officials, part of what I think is uh, uh, the agenda we need to move to beyond. One more piece of data, and then let me kind of treat a bit about so what's going on as a, as a final set of observations as we move to the panels. The housing collapse clearly in a, in a, in a state that has grown so rapidly and so dependent on housing construction has caused a lot of the anxiety. The impact of a sales tax based um, tax structure which is very responsive to uh, downturns. Uh, it has been a major part of it. Um, and rising uh, unemployment uh, has been a significant part. But let's just get a little clearer picture of immigration as we turn to that and moving on to the, to the uh, panels. Um, Arizona has had large numbers of Latino, primarily Mexican workers, over time. Until 1985, mostly they were men coming here who returned home. In 1985, the probability of a citizen, of a resident of Mexico coming to Arizona and returning was around 70 to 80%. In 2010, as a result of the tightening of the border over time, it is zero to 5%. So one of the first things that's happened has been the movement of families who continue to reside here over time. The cross, border crossing in 1990 cost $500. It costs approximately $3,000 today for the coyotes. Border crossings into the U.S. in the late 70s, late 80s rather, 70% came from Baja California. Today, only 15% come from Baja California as a result of several federal programs, Operation Gatekeeper, Blockade, um, and the Patriot Act that changed that. For Arizona, in 1990, only 5% of the entrance, illegal entrance into the U.S. came from the state of Sonora, and it is our dominant border. There's a little piece of Baja California, but mostly Sonora. 5% in, by 2003, 47% of all of the, the people crossing the border came from Sonora. So Arizona became a very substantial location. And finally, Arizona's undocumented population was approximately 80,000 in 1994. It is approximately 550,000 
today. So what does this mean in terms of a case study, an agenda for a state like ours? Let me offer five observations, particularly in light of the fact that the legislation, Senate Bill 1070, has literally hijacked this election. There are no other issues being discussed in Arizona. So this is an effort to try to put some of the other oxygen into the room as we as a state grapple with this in the future. First of all, Arizona is still very much a fluid, emerging, yet not fully formed society or polity. That doubling of the population that I mentioned is, a, is one of the major uh, factors in that. Secondly, I get in trouble in Arizona every time I say this, but I believe it to my toes. Arizona has never had to work for its prosperity. Beginning with the Second World War, the bow wave of growth, which brings very substantial benefit on the front end without revealing the back end costs, has allowed, the growth has allowed Arizona to continue to prosper without the fundamental efforts that other places, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, that have had to rebuild themselves, other states, uh, it has not had to face the fundamental hard work of investing in what a, 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 a diverse economy would require. Third, Arizona has been very easy prey for outside interests who want to either test or embed their policies within the state. Uh, FAIR has been involved in the immigration issue right from the very beginning. Senator Pierce now openly acknowledges that. It has been true as earlier pieces of immigration legislation have come forward. The uh, two-thirds majority to raise taxes was done by an outsider who came to run for Congress in the mid-90s. It was passed by Arizona without debate. It has virtually taken the legislature out of the business of raising taxes because you'll never get a two-thirds majority which means it always has to be put out to the people, and it hasn't been put out to the people. When California did Prop 187, within two years, an external outs uh, uh, group funded outside of Arizona put Prop 200, which passed with 56% of the vote in uh, Arizona, and the Grover Norquist pledge, 38 members of the Arizona legislature in the last session signed the pledge that they would never it raised taxes or even allowed the T word to pass their lips. Fourth, there is no dominant political culture in Arizona to unify it, contrary to the impressions of the pro um, SB 1070 group to the sense that Arizona is a, whatever one wants to say, far right or other. Its major tendencies, I believe, I think our data suggested, but I will make this as a personal observation, is moderate and center right. Look at the elections that have brought people of all parties uh, into the endeavor, and libertarian. But it is still, with those tendencies, not a major uh, impact on the political culture. And finally, people are rather strangely detached from the community and state in which they live. One of the things we hope most to find out as we pursue this civic health index is why is that? The candidates that are mostly considered are, well, they've really moved to Arizona, kind of like a resort, whatever their age, and why should they get involved? They don't, they have this wonderful life. Well, the reality is they're not going to have this wonderful life as the panels, particularly on finance, will tell you when the real uh, hit of our, of our financial difficulties. Uh, others suggest that gated communities and walls uh, to the, the privacy of houses may be a part of it. Uh, other suggestions are that uh, it's simply the nature of a dispersed western city, of which certainly Phoenix is, even increasingly Tucson. Uh, probably, above all, it is the newness of the society and of the state and of the time required to build more enduring 
and effective institutions to connect people. Our belief is that as aspirants for making it a better place, it's possible to do that. So while we grapple with the issues of the moment, the ones facing in us in this election, we're going to be trying in our center to push on to some of uh, these other ways of connecting our citizens much more fully into the political process. Thank you. Okay, hello. Congressman Flake, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Good. Hear Good. Yes, I can. And Supervisor Valadez? Hello, how are you? Good. Hi, I'm Len Downey. I'm the former executive editor of the Washington Post. I now teach at the uh, Cronkite School at Arizona State University, which has a relationship with the uh, New America uh, Foundation. And so I've been asked to come and uh, moderate this uh, discussion. Uh, and so I thought I'd start, uh, I don't know if you heard him, but Latte Kaur, Dr. Kaur, uh, just said that Senate Bill 1070 has hijacked the election campaign in Arizona and by implication is responsible for the polarization that's being, uh, political polarization that's being examined uh, by this uh, conference today. Uh, Congressman Flake, do you, do you think that's the case? <laughs> so it, it, has, it has had an impact, but, uh, you know, I, I found um, that, uh, you know, in a, in a congressional race at least, that uh, there's, there's far more concern about uh, the overall direction of the country, uh, particularly in terms of spending and the growth of government, and that uh, particularly in the last uh, few weeks, uh, you know, some of these immigration battles were were fought a little more heavily in the primaries, but now uh, there's there's more concern about uh, you know the overall direction of the country. So uh, I think that that did certainly months ago, but that seems to be on the ebb right now. Well, before I turn to the supervisor, can I just follow up on that, Congressman? Uh, if that's the case, and you talked about the concerned about government and taxes, and you're a conservative Republican, so we understand that's why you're saying that, but you don't have to campaign today. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I, it, we're talking about polarization of the electorate today. It, in fact, in Arizona, government is getting smaller in the state. Uh, taxes are not rising, except for the 1% tax that was devoted to education that was voted on by referendum, in which actually the voters approved a tax increase. Um, do you find a polarization among the voters you talk to between those who, in fact, are concerned about how government is going to respond to these crises of, uh, of uh, lack of, uh, of uh, resources for a lot of things in the state of Arizona, and um, uh, the unemployment and the other economic problems that are occurring. Uh, and then the people on the other side, as you just stated, who uh, want to keep taxes low no matter what and are still concerned about any government role in solving any of these problems. Well, I think you have the, you know, the age-old uh, battles that exist between those who see a, a broader role for government and those who uh, have more faith that the private sector can uh, can can do more to help us out of the mess we're in, and, and so I, I I don't know that uh, that you've seen a, a real increase in polarization on those issues. I think it's the old battles that are being played out, and uh, right now we have uh, you know a, a dire economic situation, particularly in Arizona, with the housing prices has hit us harder than, than most places. And I, I think what you're seeing is uh, um, people, you know, if, if the polls are any indication at least, uh, those who who uh, don't have much faith that the government is going to solve these problems uh, uh, holding sway right now. Uh, Supervisor Valadez, uh, you're, uh, you're right down there in the firing line. You are... Uh, uh, in uh, in the Tucson area, uh, you're near the border, so the immigration issues obviously are lively where you are, where you are located. 
but also you're facing at the at the community level uh, the the, uh, the the problems of unemployment and foreclosures and uh, and uh, limited uh, uh, public resources to address the various problems. Uh, if I can start where I started with Congressman Flake, uh, how important do you think that immigration remains uh, as an issue in this campaign, and how polarizing do you feel it is? Do you think do you, do you have the feeling that there's not an easy or, or, or is there, a, not, easy is the wrong word, do you have a feeling that people are trying to figure out a way to um, uh, make this work as opposed to continuing to argue bitterly over it? Um, I'll tell you what, um, you know, with all due respect, maybe in a congressional race uh, up in Maricopa County it's not a big deal, but I would tell you also that in the, particularly the gubernatorial race, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, what happens is the 1070 was frankly, uh, an emotional response uh, to uh, the immigration issue. Uh, I think the culture or, or what people are looking for in an election cycle hasn't changed. They're looking for candidates and people that they can connect with. So the, 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 what they're seeking hasn't changed. What has changed is the style of campaign. And I think 1070 is very indicative of that change in style of campaigning, which has become more emotional and less about solving issues. If you take a look at 1070, it was an issue that arose, uh, frankly, the fact that the federal government has failed to address the issue of immigration. And I, it doesn't matter which side you're on, it's, it's a very difficult issue, it's a very complex issue, and regardless of, the, again, of either side, there are arguments that can be made that are very good arguments. Uh, so I, I, I would tell you that, that when you take a look at particularly the gubernator last gubernatorial debate, uh, where there was even a 16-second pause that was aired on YouTube, on Facebook, and on everything else, and then you see a jump in the governor's uh, numbers after that, it's hard to attribute what that might be to us in the fact that she's incredibly popular because of her position on 1070. Uh, so I think it, it still remains locally, uh, and, and as much, I think, in, throughout the state, on the local and statewide races, uh, I think it, it remains a very pressing issue. Unfortunately, at the local and state uh, statewide level, there's not much we can do about it. Uh, and are you concerned about the image of the state and the image of Tucson uh, uh, nationally, as Dr. Kaur alluded to, of of this being uh, of, of Arizona being primarily seen through this prism at the moment nationally? Well, I'll tell you what I, I am. Um, and, and I would tell you that, that I'm the chairman of the board of Pima County, so I would also include greater Pima County area. Pima County itself has got uh, uh, one of the biggest borders uh, with Mexico of any community uh, uh, along the southwest border. I would tell you that it's very concerning because, again, it is very easy to do a 20-second soundbite uh, and give a very false illusion about what is going on. The truth is that there are two very big and very important issues here, one of which is the issue of undocumented immigration, which frankly the federal government is the only one that has the authority or the ability to solve it, and they haven't. The other is that of, frankly, drug smuggling, which unfortunately most people, particularly because of the sound bites that we have uh, heard over the last several months, associate the two. And there's there, a lot of the folks that are involved in the drug trade have undocumented status. So there is some relationship, but frankly, when there are people coming across the border who are simply coming here because they can make it a little extra money to be able to get to, to their families, it, it's a different issue altogether. Again, we may be able to do something about the law enforcement side making, uh, and dealing with the drug trafficking, but the other issue of, of undocumented immigration, only the federal government has the authority to do. Congressman, can I turn to you about that? Uh, SB 1070 obviously was passed in, because there's a vacuum in, uh, in uh, congressional legislation uh, on this subject. It, it's been deadlocked. Congress has been deadlocked over it. Why, won't, why, why has Congress not acted? How should Congress act? How could it happen? Why, why, why don't Republicans and Democrats find a way to deal with this problem? Well, I, I think um, uh, the supervisor just explained that Difficulty. It is easy to use this issue uh, in a soundbite, and uh, um, we've seen at the national level, I think, both sides, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, not knowing exactly how how to how this 
issue is going to play out. Um, but, uh, but I have to say that, that you can, in Arizona, uh, win a primary election as a Republican and still favor a comprehensive reform, uh, as, as, as I do. Uh, you have to explain it a little longer. It doesn't lend itself to a, to a South bite. It's, it's much easier just to say, you know, seal the border and enforce the law. But, uh, but I, I don't think that's a very thoughtful approach. And, and I think that uh, if you if you do get out there in the community and explain your position and explain why, as the supervisor said, the federal government uh, has to solve the issue, uh, then, then people will understand that and will be with you. Um, but it is difficult at the national level. Um, I, you know, I've, I've introduced legislation, I've backed legislation ever since I've been in Congress to to uh, push for comprehensive reform, and, and it, it would be uh, politically easier uh, not to do so, coming from Arizona, just to say, uh, seal the border and enforce the law, but, you know, it, that, that, that doesn't solve the problem. And I, I think that you can, it takes a little more effort, but you can uh, stand for real reform and still be reelected. Uh, Congressman, if uh, the Republicans uh, uh, retake the House, the control of the House of Representatives, as looks uh, quite likely now, and the Senate comes out, you know, roughly a vote or two one way or the other, probably a, a very close, uh, a, a very close control of the Senate, um, is that going to make it more or easier, uh, more difficult or easier to uh, pass uh, some kind of comprehensive reform legislation? Will will the Republicans have a, a, feel some responsibility? Uh, to show that they can uh, accomplish some things in control of the House and nearly in control of the Senate, if not in control of it. I, I hope we do. I mean, just as you know, only Nixon could go to China. Maybe only Republicans can do immigration reform. I, I, I think that a lot of Republicans do recognize that while this issue may inure to our short-term political benefit uh, by using sound, sound bites and, and just by simplifying the issue. Uh, Long term, uh, it doesn't do the party any good uh, to use, use this as a wedge issue. And, and I, I think that a good number of Republicans in the House and Senate recognize that. Whether that's a majority, I don't know. I would love to uh, be able to pass uh, comprehensive reform and get this issue off the table uh, to, to the extent we can uh, for 2012, because I think the longer we go, uh, the more this this issue and the way it's playing now does not uh, favor Republicans. Now that Senator McCain has won his primary fight and appears to be a shoe in for uh, election in the general election, um, what do you think he's going to do about this when he retakes his seat in the Senate? Well, the Senator has said, and he's had this position for longer than just his primary race here, that uh, he recognized during the presidential campaign that politically, until we have a more secure border, uh, we can't move on the other uh, the items of comprehensive reform. And so uh, I think that uh, the initial moves will be certainly to make sure that we can have a more secure border, which I, I, I certainly favor. I, I want to think that it would be easier to secure the border if we move on the other things simultaneously. But politically, uh, uh, he's probably right. So uh, I, I think that, um, that he'll do what he said he, he'll do, uh, move on the other items when we can ensure uh, the country that we have a more secure border. Uh, Supervisor Valadez, let's turn to um, the other uh, issues that uh, Dr. Kaur raised about the health of Arizona and the future of Arizona. Uh, what, what has been the impact on Pima County of the, uh, of the uh, state uh, uh, budget cutbacks and uh, uh, what, what solution do you see to providing sufficient uh, public resources to meet the needs of, the, of your county and of the state? Right. Um, I'll tell you what, I spent seven years in the legislature in Arizona, both in the House and the Senate, and, and so I have that as background as well, and I think uh, the congressman was there slightly before I was. Um, so he has uh, the same level of experience as well. But I, I think, uh, now speaking as, as the chair of the board, I, uh, I've got to tell you that, that what seems to be the tendency uh, consistently uh, in the state of Arizona is that the largest burden single burden in terms of a governmental entity tends to be the county. Uh, so what happens is that uh, usually what happens is the Maricopa County, being the largest county, followed by Pima County, has to shoulder about 
probably ni- 85 to 90 percent of the burden uh, of the sheriff, of our sheriff, of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of uh, what the legislature usually has us do, whereas the municipalities are fairly untouched. Um, so uh, that, that's, one, uh, that's one part of the equation. About the beginning of what was considered the recession, Pima County um, started having discussions amongst the board and our county administrator about how strategically we were going to deal with what we saw uh, looming in, in, the, uh, in the future, which is today, obviously, where we're looking at about a, for next year, a drop of about 22 to $24 million in, the, uh, in what we get from the uh, general fund from property tax. So just strategically, that's, that's what we were looking at. But so we have strategically planned. Uh, we are in uh, salt. We're in the black. Um, what that means is that we didn't fill uh, positions through attrition. We actually, up until this past year, have consistently lowered the tax rate. Um, we have uh, we have uh, done five to ten to twelve percent cuts across the board over the last three years. Uh, and again, trying to shrink. Uh, and manage financially uh, our way through this cr- uh, financial crisis, and thus far we've done decently well. What, where, where, where do you think where do you think that leaves county citizens, your, the citizens of your county? Well, right now I got to tell you that I think it leaves us in a very good place. Where it's going to hurt, and, and I was recently asked, well, if you're okay, what what's your greatest fear? I said the Arizona legislature, um, because when they meet. Well, what generally has been the the, uh, the, uh, the modus operandi is they will meet with the manager of Maricopa County, who offers up you know a, a sizable chunk of money, will offer on our behalf over our objection uh, another uh, sum of money, and then Maricopa is out of the equation. The problem is Pima County is unique amongst Arizona counties <coughs> in that if it was a municipality, it would be the second largest municipality in Pima County. We have a lot of unincorporated urbanized areas that we as a county support. You're, you're getting into a bit of local detail there, Supervisor. I, I, okay. I guess what I'm driving at is uh, to what extent do you think, particularly with that, I was, a lot of people were surprised by the, uh, the passage of the uh, of one cent sales tax increase to finance education. Uh, is being contrary to, for instance, the direction of the legislature and the direction of the political rhetoric in Arizona about taxes. Do you, where do you see the? I'm trying. I guess I'm trying to get. Where do you see the equation between public support for uh, uh, for for certain kinds of government roles uh, and having to pay for them, as opposed to uh, wanting to just keep taxes low? Period. Okay. And, and, and as a matter of history, I was part of the negotiating team that put that package together uh, for the for the ballot. But I think what's happened in Arizona is that there's been a very, a very large disconnect between the legislative strategies and, frankly, the rest of Arizona. In that I think when the people and the voters of Arizona are presented with a solution that, look, this is going to help resolve some of the issues we have in education or whatever the issue is, the voters of Arizona have stepped up to the plate and said, yes, that's how we want it. Because Frankly, with the two-thirds majority uh, that's required for some of the, uh, the Prop 106s, it's, it's become very, very difficult to do in the legislature. And frankly, there has been a lack of the will on the part of the majority. Per- so. Congressman Flake, uh, I, I know you're in Congress now. You don't have to worry about necessarily the legislature. But uh, what is your view of this equation of, of uh uh, you know, necessary public support for certain state services. State parks are being closed down in Arizona, as you know. A lot of things have been specifically earmarked in previous legislation uh, uh, to be paid for out of public funds. Uh, the, those uh, those funds are being shifted to just keep the state going day to day. Um, uh, is there where's the limit to how low taxes can be versus what public services there should be in a state like Arizona that's growing? Well, I think. Arizona, in order to uh, grow uh, the future, has to recognize that uh, uh, we are in competition with other states around us, and um, if we have a tax burden regulatory environment that's uh, not conducive, uh, we're simply not going to lure the kind of businesses in that the states around us are going to do, or they'll lure them away from us. And 
so there are there are you know outside limitations that we have to deal with as well in order to be competitive. And, and I think uh, most Arizonans recognize that. I think uh, most made the calculation that we could uh, survive a, a one cent sales tax if it's a temporary tax uh, for the next couple of years to blunt some of the impact of the budget cuts. But um, if you look around the country at what some of what some other states are doing, particularly New Jersey, they recognize that uh, you know if leaders will stand up and say this is what we've got to do. Um, and we're, we're simply going to have to get through this, and we're going to have to uh, diminish our expectations about certain services uh, for a while at least uh, in order to get through this environment. Uh, that's what we're going to have to do. So I, I think that Arizona simply uh, realized uh, that this may be what we have to do in the short term, but for the long term we have to have a good tax and regulatory environment. Dr. Kaur talked about how his um, research has shown a very low level of civic political engagement in, uh, in Arizona, surprising, quite surprising to him. Is that because Arizonans are quite happy with their lives and, and uh, therefore don't feel the need to be engaged with each other and with their politicians? Or are they, are they so turned off uh, by uh, uh, politics and by the uh, way in which the state issues are being tackled that they simply don't see any purpose in being engaged? They're quite happy with their politicians. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your case, that seems to be true. <laughs> That's what I try to convince myself, anyway. Right. Uh, in Arizona, we have, a, we have a lot of other things to do. I mean, this is a beautiful state. Uh, and yet, he, I, if I just interrupt for a second, Dr. Kaur, perhaps before you were listening in, said that his survey showed, that I think, was roughly 10 percent, tell me 10 percent approval of, uh, of uh, how uh, uh, public officials are, are carrying out their duties in Arizona. Does that surprise you? <laughs> no, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, nothing surprises me anymore. But I, but I will say that uh, in this last primary election, uh, we had a, a massive turnout in the East Valley. Uh, we had, I think it was upwards of 50% for a, a primary that really wasn't all that contested. So I, I, I you know, on the Republican side, on the Democratic side, it was uh, considerably lower. But there, there, uh, there seems to be more engagement uh, than, than I've seen. And I, I just uh, went to one of the Tea Party groups here in the East Valley, and there were some 500 people there. This was, this was just a a week or so ago, and uh, so I, I've seen more engagement, more involvement of late uh, than I have, uh, you know, in years past. If, if I can pick last year, last year uh, with the uh, uh, the health care bill that was, was going through, I had a, a town hall with uh, some 2,500 people and had to turn away more. So I, I guess I, I, I would question the premise. If, if I can ask you to look at, you brought up the Tea Party, if I can ask you to look at that movement in Arizona uh, as a social scientist or a political scientist rather than as a candidate for office, in other words, no sound bites, please, can you help explain what you see this movement is representing and what its future might be? Well, I, I see it as a manifestation of a lot of frustration out there. Uh, it's, uh, I think, focused uh, mostly, it's got to start, certainly. Uh, with the concern over our uh, fiscal crisis. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I've heard expressed in the, in the meetings that I've gone to more than anything. Now, there's, there's some cognitive dissonance there. I mean, we had a, a man at the last meeting, as I was leaving, pulled me aside and said, be sure you vote for that $250 increase, uh, you know, Social Security. <laughs> a man of a certain age, no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and so I mean you'll, you'll have a certain amount of that, and you have some that are on other you know issues. But but by and large, it seems to be uh, you know this this uh, feeling of a, a loss of of influence or, or control over the situation uh, in Washington that is affecting them deeply. Uh, Supervisor Valadez. Uh Speaking of involvement, uh, Dr. Kaur's research also shows a lower level of involvement in politics uh, and a very low level of voter registration and voting amongst the Latino population in the state. Uh, why is that? And why in particular, 
as that population grows, uh, and as it, it obviously has very important issues facing it that would, one would expect people to want to speak out about, and particularly with the impact of SB 1070, why, why is the level of Latino population in Arizona politics so low, and do you expect that to change at any point? Well, I, I hope so, and, I, and I, uh, I second the motion by the congressman that, that uh, I always think my constituents like me as well. <laughs> uh, but the, the truth, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I first ran 1996 for the state house, there were roughly 200,000 people in my district, of which only about 55 to 52,000 were registered to vote. It was a, it's a, it's a primary dominated district, so there's about 35,000 uh, Democrats in the district. Of that, about 7,500 voted, of which I've got the, I got the majority at about 3,800. So 3,800 people made the decision who their state representative is going to be for 200,000. Uh, and mine is a majority minority district as well, um, or it was at that point as well. Uh, so, I mean, just to give you a perspective in, as to what uh, Dr. Kaur was talking about, it, it, it's a very real concern, it's a very real issue. Uh, I, I think that, that, that the answer to that is much, much sociologically and politically co complicated. Um, I, think, I think it goes back to why are we seeing uh, greater involvement today uh, than before? People are scared. Uh, they've lost their jobs. They've lost their homes. They don't have an income. They don't know where their next paycheck is going to come from. <coughs> People are scared. Um, no. Generally, I, I think the Congressman is absolutely correct in, in that unless that kind of mechanism exists in a political election, it tends towards not getting people involved. Today, we see that in the Tea Party, we see that it, it, in different ways. Now, do I expect the, the influence of the Latino population, or frankly, to be honest, the minority population in Arizona increase? Well, the best answer I can give you is I certainly hope so. Um, I'll tell you that a lot of times, even in a good economy, uh, you look, you walk around uh, the local neighborhoods, and what you see is, is families, even then, struggling to put food on the plate. Uh, it, 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 traditionally, culturally, what you see amongst minority communities, not just Latino communities, is that you have multi-family households or multi-generational households. So it's a much bigger kind of uh, household to feed, to take care of, to, to, to deal with. So you've got a lot of different, more immediate issues to deal with than whether or not you're registered to vote. Now, should they? Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's why you see a lot of outreach, uh, both on a partisan and nonpartisan basis, to try and get our community registered. Will it increase? I certainly hope so. Uh, here in Pima County, we're already over a third of the population. Um, and if you look at the Board of Supervisors, we have five members. Three of us are of Latino descent, or two of us are of Latino descent. So, again, you, you see that becoming a greater influence in, in politics in Arizona, I believe, at least in southern Arizona. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Congressman. You've been very helpful. You did not campaign very much. We appreciate that. Uh, talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.